Nelson Mandela's first steps back to freedom. This was the moment which transformed South Africa forever. 20 years after that extraordinary day in February 1990, when I reported Nelson Mandela's release. I've come back to a different country to see what has changed, what still needs to change. And to meet the last white president, the man who finally decided to set Mr Mandela free. I do, and, I do. And the archbishop who led the protests which made it inevitable. I realise that after the announcements which I made, South Africa would be changed forever. Not every country has a Nelson Mandela. We were blessed. We, I think we, we could so easily have gone up in flames. The Victoria and Alfred waterfront in Cape Town. 20 years ago, South Africa looked nothing like this. Black people were servants, not spenders. And you never saw black and white as couples. It had been illegal under the Mixed Marriages Act. 20 years ago, I could never have made the journey which now starts from these docks to South Africa's most notorious prison, Robben Island. It's still an extraordinary journey, leaving behind the magnificence of Table Mountain and the vibrant city of Cape Town a few miles towards what remains still a pretty bleak island, Robben Island, somewhere from which no one really had any hope of escape, a place of incarceration for people whom the white South African regime simply regarded as too dangerous, capable somehow of bringing all the restrictions, all the cruelties, all the injustices of apartheid and rigid racial segregation tumbling down. Summer or winter, this prison feels cruel. Prisoners complained of the extremes being alternately burnt and then frozen. This courtyard is not overlaid with concrete. Today's tourists fall gradually quiet as a former political prisoner guides us through some of the rigors which Nelson Mandela endured as he started his life sentence here back in 1964. In the early part of the 60s, prisoners kept in the single cells were not allowed to get out of the prison precinct. They had to do their hard labor right here in this courtyard, where they were considered to be dangerous. No more, no more, no more, no more Apartheid, the rigid separation of black and white, was an immense apparatus. It excluded the black majority from good education, all the best houses, land and jobs, and, of course, from political power. Any defiance, like the mass burning of passbooks, which only blacks had to carry, was met with overwhelming violence. The Sharpeville massacre of 69 men, women and children in 1960 was simply the most notorious in a chain of state killing which ran on through all Nelson Mandela's 27 prison years. Nelson Mandela himself called the years on Robben Island the dark years. In his famous autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom, he writes about all the time he spent in this tiny cell the challenge for every prisoner, he wrote, particularly every political prisoner, is how to survive prison intact, how to emerge from prison undiminished, how to conserve and even replenish one's beliefs. Nelson Mandela knew despair and he knew he had to fight it. He wrote, there were many dark moments when my faith in humanity was sorely tested, but I would not 
and could not give myself up to despair. That way lay defeat and death. On the outside, South Africa's security forces kept up their violence. Violence I was reporting almost every day. The riot squad hit everyone in their path, including passers-by, scattering shopping, beating people to the ground, beating people on the ground. We saw a policeman coming out of a shop, grinning, enjoying himself. But if the police then seemed to have an unending appetite for all this, South Africa's rulers were finally buckling under the pressure of outrage, both within the country and around the world. And then they started to beat me. As President de Klerk arrived in Parliament to tell the minority who rule of the most dramatic liberalisation South Africa has ever seen. Outside, those who must still wait for the vote made clear their priorities. Just a few hundred yards from the chamber, thousands on the march, a demonstration licensed by the authorities, taking the lead the key figures in anti-apartheid opposition, Winnie Mandela hoping for news of her husband's release next to Archbishop Desmond Tutu. The whole crowd exultant, expectant, little knowing how many of their demands were about to be met. The prohibition of the African National Congress, the Pan-Africanist Congress, the South African Communist Party and a number of subsidiary organizations is being rescinded. In the chamber, applause mingled with boos from the far right. Watching on television in the Cape Town deanery, Archbishop Desmond Tutu was thrilled by the news. <laughs> <laughs> Today, the police stood back, allowing ANC supporters their head. A demonstrator with replica gun astride Jan Smuts, South Africa's most famous world statesman. The people on the streets believe today is their victory, not President de Klerk's. Partial victory, not complete, but victory after years of defiance. But what the crowds really wanted was news of Nelson Mandela's release and President de Klerk left that almost till last. I wish to put it plainly that the government has taken a firm decision to release Mr. Mandela unconditionally. I'm serious, I'm serious about bringing this matter to finality without delay. It was a, must have been a really tense day for you. Was it the biggest day of your life? I would say one of the biggest days of my life. I realized that after the announcements which I made, South Africa would be changed forever. We were caught up in a downward spiral of growing isolation and of growing violence and growing acts uh, using methods of terrorism. How much were you influenced by what had happened in Europe, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the spreading disintegration of communism? The fall of the Berlin Wall played an important role in what I could do. If that did not happen, it would have been very difficult to unban the South African Communist Party and even Nkonte where seas were. The ANC and its military wing. And its military wing, which were uh, financed, trained, supplied by arms, with arms, etc., etc., by the USSR. Was it a moral as much as, perhaps more than a political decision for you, a realization that actually apartheid was morally wrong? Absolutely. Quite early in the 80s, I decided for myself, separate development as it was then in place has failed. And that dramatic change is necessary. 